This morning, please, to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. And let's go ahead and stand, please. And of course, we're working our way through this gospel on Sunday mornings. We've been in it just about a year now. And I want to go back to verse number 13 and just begin to read through again uh, uh, some of what we have dealt with. And we will bring that part to a conclusion then this morning. So Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse number 13, we're going to read down through verse number 31. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible." Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold, now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, pray for your help this morning. As always, these are your words breathed out by you through your Holy Spirit. And therefore, the meaning rests with you and the power of these words to shape the way we think and respond rests with you. And we pray for your help then this morning to that end, that we would understand and respond properly to the word of God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may, of course, be seated. Well, I mentioned last week that it's my opinion, my understanding, maybe a better word, <clears throat> that the, the, the two passages that we, that we read there in verse number 13, the two incidents of the touching of the young children, even to infants, and the story of the rich young ruler are not separated from each other, but are necessary to each other to help fill out the understanding. The rich young ruler was inquiring about salvation. The text itself calls it eternal life, calls it the kingdom of God, calls it being saved, and it's all one and the same thing. How would a person be 
born again? How would a person become a believer in Jesus Christ? <clears throat> and I proposed to you last week that there is an amazing dimension lesson about this salvation that Jesus teaches, which is that unless somebody comes as a little child, not when a little child, not that only the infants can be saved, but if you do not come as a little child, you cannot have it. And that is exactly what Jesus said in verse number 15, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Jesus is the door, he is the doorkeeper, all who would enter will come in as small children. And when we ask ourselves, well, what does he mean by that? We immediately then are introduced to the rich young ruler who apparently has everything and brings it all to Christ. All of his status, all of his wealth, all of his self-assurance, his well-intended self-assurance about his religion, all is brought to Christ, and Christ then helps him to see what it would mean for him to come as a small child. He must sell all that he has, and he must give it to the poor. The young man goes away both sad and angry, and the apostles remain, but they are perplexed. Jesus simply says it is hard for those who are rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Something, by the way, that should not be lost in us living in one of the most affluent nations in the history of the world. In the history of the world. Um, and Jesus goes on to al- explain that by, in, I, I think in just his comment, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. It is the nature of having riches to place our confidence in those riches. To think that they can really do things for us. And I would just, again, point out, folks, that in America, we tend to think everything can be fixed if there was just more of this wealth. Every societal problem can be fixed if there was more money. Every educational issue can be resolved if there's more money. Every political crisis can be resolved if there's but more money. And if we can get the money to flow from the wrong hands to the right hands, then we can cure all kinds of things. There is this tendency among people to value wealth in an ungodly way. And so Jesus is not just making idle banter. And so the apostles come to the conclusion then that no one is going to get saved in that category. And Jesus says, well, it's possible with God. It is possible with God. And, And once again, the whole initiative and impetus for salvation is thrown back where it properly belongs and that is upon the one who does the saving. That leads us then to where we will begin this morning, and that is with verse number 28. Peter, whom we know as the man who tends to put his foot in his mouth, is nevertheless a jewel to us because he does put his foot in his mouth, but he is always thinking. And you can just kind of see him standing there, chewing on all that is going on and all that has been said. And he just makes a statement. Matthew's account, which we will read in a few minutes, forms it as a statement and a question. The question in Mark's gospel is implied. We have left all and followed you. We have left all and followed you. The unasked question in Mark's gospel is, what about us? What about us? Where does that leave us? So I've labeled this, and if you look at the sermon titles, however they get posted, whenever they get posted on the web, this is the title of the sermon. Another amazing lesson about salvation. Amazing lesson number one is that you can't get it unless you come as a small child. God doesn't need people to come in their fullness, whether that be intellectual fullness, moral fullness, financial fullness. God is not looking for those kind of people. They are most definitely unwelcome into the kingdom of God. Come as a child, come needy, come empty. Come needing something, not bringing something, and you can have it. Well, where does that leave those of you that have it? Where does that leave those of you who did come as little children? 
What about you? <clears throat> Jesus could have said to Peter, well, you're, you're clearly a testimony to the saving power of God, right? Nothing is impossible with God. Here you are, you're saved. You're a testimony to the miracle-working power of God. But Jesus goes much farther than that and says much more than that. And, and one of the things that I really want you to notice, folks, is that Jesus in no way takes offense at Peter's blatant self-interest. Sometimes in even conservative biblical Christianity, we take self-interest as some kind of a dirty thing, as some kind of a vice to be hidden, that nobody should say, I want to know what's in it for me. But I would just point out to you folks on a broad principle that the Bible doesn't know anything about human beings who function at any other level. Solomon said, if thou shalt be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou be a fool, thou alone shalt bear it. I am the recipient. I am the one who is going to be on the receiving end of both my wisdom and my folly. And I view the world through very selfish eyes. And to pretend that I don't is to deny a very fundamental biblical fact about human beings. Every human being is energized and motivated by self-interest. The secret, if I could put it that way, folks, the trick is, is in believing where your self-interest really lies. There's the problem. The problem is not that we have self-interest. The difference between unbelievers and believers is not that believers are altruistic and unbelievers are selfish. The difference is where they are orienting, orientating their self-interest. Where does it lie? <clears throat> In fact, folks, I would call your attention back to verse number 21. <clears throat> right? What did Jesus really say to the rich young ruler? One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. You will have treasure in heaven. Right? So Jesus isn't even denying this man's self-interest. He's just pointing out that in a, in a very simple way that, that the self-interest that he has is misdirected. I will make you rich, says Jesus. <clears throat> so we don't want to think critically of Peter for asking the question because the reality, folks, is even if we're trying to squash it down and keep it under wraps, it is the question that we are all asking. If I live this life of Christianity, if I do what it commands, and if I surrender what it requires me to surrender, if I embrace what it requires me to embrace, what's in it for me? Why should I do that? That's the question that Jesus answered. Here's what's in it for you. Here is what you can expect. So before we let Jesus answer the question, I do want to add this to it. Verse number 29, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. I would just, I would caution us, about reading those verses purely in mathematical terms, purely in capitalistic terms, purely in materialistic dimensions. In Mark chapter 10 and verse number 20, Jesus uses a measurement. It is the measurement of, I'm sorry, verse number 30, of a hundredfold and hundredfold. And hundredfold is not 100%, it is 100 times. If we just come and apply this as a mathematical formula, then we should assume that anybody who has given up a house should have 100. That's the formula. And if we're going to get that rigid about it, then maybe we would ask the question about... and. and and I've known most of you for a long, long time. I'm not aware of any of you that have 100 homes. 
Perhaps in some way, my wife and I could make the argument that we did give up a house. We, we had a church that we loved and a house that we loved, and we were close to both of our families, and we were having a good time serving the Lord in our church, and we left all that to go to college to prepare for ministry, and it was a heart-wrenching thing at the time that we did it. So, But I don't have 100 houses. Is this purely a mathematical formula? What would it mean to lose one brother and to gain a hundred? And would you want a hundred brothers? If you had one brother, would you want a hundred more just like the one you had? I have an older brother. He's a half-brother. I'm not sure I would have wanted him duplicated, let alone multiplied a hundred times. What if you left your wife for Jesus' sake in the Gospels, and this is purely a mathematical formula? Would you want a hundred wives? Would any of us be comfortable with somebody that had a hundred wives? So I think when we read it, folks, that we understand there's a broader principle being made here than simply the application of a mathematical formula. And certainly we want to be careful about those who would abuse this to teach that the end game of salvation is simply the multiplication of material wealth. The kind of Joel Osteen mentality, your best life now. And As someone has wisely pointed out, if this is your best life now, you're a lost person. This is not the best life. Not yet. Not now. Additionally, folks, we don't want to gloss over the fact that this verse promises persecutions. And I think every normal, rational person wants to keep those to a minimum. If you've been following the news, one of the larger, more prominent churches in California announced that they had reached the end of their rope, so to speak. They were no longer going to bow down to the harsh California guidelines. They were going to reassemble, and the local official said, and we're turning off the electricity to your building this morning. Now, whether or not they did that, I don't know, but that was what they said they would do. Nobody wants a hundred times of persecution. So... So I'm just, I'm just pointing out, folks, Jesus is saying something. He's saying it accurately, he's saying it truthfully. He's saying it is God, the God-man. He's saying it divinely. But it's, it's not a grid that you can put over your life and, the, and where you can do the math and go, I gave a dollar, so I got a $100 check coming, and, and I would expect that. And if I don't get that, God has somehow lied to me. And, and even more emphatically, folks, to defend what I've just been arguing is that We don't see that duplicated in the life of Peter. Notice that Peter makes a very emphatic statement there in verse number 28. We have left all, and we have followed thee. We have left all, and we have followed thee. Let's begin to ask ourselves how this might all play out from the way the Lord responds to that. Right? How do I interpret Peter's statement Right? Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything, give it to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Peter said, we did leave everything. In what way did Peter leave everything? If you want to turn to it, you can turn back to Mark chapter 1. I just want to read a few selections of verses right, so we can refresh the life and ministry of Peter. Right? Here, is, here is Peter, emphatic and clear. We left everything. But I would point out to you folks that he didn't leave everything the way that Jesus instructed the rich young ruler to leave everything. Mark 1.16, now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he, and of course the he here is Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come after me, and come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Peter said, we've left all. Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't leave everything. They left their nets. Mark chapter 1, verse number 29, and forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon, that's Peter, and Andrew with James and John. 
Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, take up your cross, follow me. Peter said, we've done that. Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't. You still have a house. No, you didn't. You walked away from your nets. I won't even turn to it, but 1 Corinthians 9, 5 is very clear that Peter's wife traveled with him long after Christ had been crucified, taken to heaven, Peter in his apostolic ministry. All those places in the book of Acts where Peter is traveling, folks, his wife is traveling with him. 1 Corinthians 9, 5, have we not power or the authority to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Paul pointed his finger at Peter and said, Peter travels with his wife. So in other words, folks, there's something going on here. There's much, much, much more going on here than simply the mechanical abandonment of property. The, the legal transferring of real estate ownership, of having the garage sale to end all garage sales so that when it is over, you have no place to live, no clothes to wear. Everything that you have has been given to the mission and to Salvation Army. And you are now destitute, but you console yourself with treasure in heaven. And in fact, in verse number 29, Jesus isn't even treating it as a mandate, but simply as a statement of fact. If this is what you do, this is what you'll have. And one of the things that you will have are persecutions, the pressures that come. Now, one of the things that is implied in this, folks, which really is probably a separate sermon, but I think we would understand it quickly, is that there is a consequence for for embracing Christ, and the consequence comes in the form of relationships. There's a lot of talk in the conservative evangelical world about having a relationship with Jesus. That's a good thing. The Bible is pretty clear that to have a relationship with Jesus may put other relationships in jeopardy. Relationships with your own parents, with your own children, with your family members, with the unbelieving world. This is why there will be persecutions to select Christ. We kind of worked our way through this a couple of weeks ago. 1 Corinthians 5, the the ultimate theme of the passage, 1 Corinthians 5, of dealing with a young man in his sin is that our loyalties must lie with Christ, and when they lie with Christ, that means they sometimes come at the expense of people. So these people that Jesus is talking about are people who have chosen Jesus over their children, who have chosen Jesus over their family, have chosen Jesus over their marriage, chosen Jesus over their physical life. These are the demands, folks. This is at the very least the expectation that when those conflicts come, we will always come down on the side of Christ. It's not that we go out of our way to be mean or nasty or difficult or obstinate. It is that we are willing to experience the loss of other relationships for the sake of not losing the supreme relationship, the one that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of these people have left their lands, which our homes are precious to us, but in, in the Jewish world, right? These lands go all the way back to Joshua, to the division of the land. These territories are sacred territories. So we recognize that there is a demand being made here that is as much emotional than there is mechanical. We could put it this way, folks. What if the rich young ruler had done that? 
How would we interpret this? If he did go out and sell all of his goods, but his heart went with them. In other words, what if he was like Lot's wife, right? This was the problem with Lot's wife. Her body left Lot, but her heart didn't. Is that adequate? <clears throat> I will do mechanically what is compelled of me, but inside I'm not doing it. Hey, listen, I live in that world. I put a mask on my face, <clears throat> but my heart is in non-compliance. Does that count for anything? <clears throat> perhaps physically. So, <clears throat> what is Jesus getting at? Because I really, really, what I'm trying to do here, folks, is, is understand what Jesus is demanding. And it's a legitimate question. What if the demand really was that we had to go home this afternoon, put our houses on the market, sell them, put our cars up for sale, sell them? Get rid of everything but the absolute most basic necessities, the clothes on our back. And that was the price of admission to the kingdom of heaven. What would that do? How many, how many people would really embrace that? How many people have that kind of faith that they would do that? And what about those who did it but didn't really believe it? <clears throat> they begrudged it and hated it. Where would we place them in all of this? But before I digress too far down that line, folks, I just want to point out that Jesus really isn't exploring the depths of the human heart. He is really exploring the generosity of God. Here is the second amazing lesson about salvation. Um, lesson number one, only those who enter as children get it. Lesson number two, to those who have it, God is abundantly generous. God is abundantly generous to those that have it. That's really the gist, folks, of verse number 30. Now, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, light, eternal life, many that are first shall be last, and the last first. You know, the Lord could save us and then say to us, you know, you already got more than you deserve. You didn't deserve salvation. You got salvation. You ought to just be happy with that. But God is abundantly generous. He is not that kind of God. He is not the miser God. <clears throat> he is the 100-fold generous kind of God. Not that you get 100% back, but you get 100 times back. So let me play the hypocrite for a second. Having just gone through this big, long explanation of why you shouldn't think about this mechanically and mathematically, play the game with me. How much would you have in the bank if God deposited on December 31st, 2020, 100 times what you gave him in 2020? Not 100% of, but 100 times. If you gave 10,000, it would be 100 times 10,000. He's that kind of generous. And Jesus is pointing out that that generosity in verse number 30 has both an eternal and a temporal component to it. <clears throat> that it is not all doom and gloom and poverty and persecution in this life. And additionally, that there is something to come beyond that, in the world to come, eternal life. As one commentator said, we may give up one doorknob, but we will gain access to hundreds. Secondly, <clears throat> with reference to the generosity of God, verse number 30, Gener God's generosity is governed by his own sovereignty. How will God's generosity work? Will it be a merit system of generosity? Not necessarily so. 
it will be a divine system of generosity that will take on this component, verse number 31, many that are first shall be last, and the last first. What does that mean? Does it mean the first one to serve gets the most reward? Does the one who gives up the most gains the most? Does it mean if you give up little, you will gain little? Paul's very clear that a man will sow, reap according as he sows. Let me ask you if you were going to leave Mark now this morning, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19 is simply helpful for us in understanding what Jesus means by the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I just want to read a few verses in Matthew 19 just so that we can see that we're, we're dealing with the same time frame, we're dealing with the same subject matter. Mark doesn't record what Matthew records, but they're both involved in the same thing. In other words, I'm not going far afield to get to the explanation of what Jesus means. Verse number 14, or verse number 13 of Matthew 19, Then there were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, Suffer little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Right, so, we, so we're kind of anchored there, right? We know what's going on there. Verse number 16, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? There's the rich young ruler. Right? So again, we're kind of anchored in that same place down to verse number 26. Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, with God all things are possible. We have, we've just been reading that conversation. Verse number 27, Peter then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, followed thee. What shall we have therefore? What do we get? What do we get? Verse number 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, the renewal, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's what they get. And everyone, verse 29, that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jump ahead to chapter 20 and verse number 16. We're going to come back to chapter 20 momentarily. Verse number 16 of chapter 20. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. For many be called, but few chosen. So in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 15, you have some idea of what Jesus means by what he just said. Right? He introduced it in verse number 30. Many that are first shall be last, the last shall be first. He summarizes it in verse number 16. So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. And we understand that he hasn't lost his train of thought because he's begun and end there, but also because of the way verse number, chapter number 20 begins, verse number 1, 4. Or as we would most likely say, because. <clears throat> Many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first, because the kingdom of heaven is like this. Because of the nature of the kingdom of heaven, this is why it's going to be this way. What happens in verses 1 through 15 are told over time. This is a story that is told with reference to time. Verse number 1, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers in his vineyard. And when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard and he went out about the third hour. In Jewish time, this would be about nine in the morning. And he sent them into his vineyard. I'm sorry, verse number three. Went out about the third hour, saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said to them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And and again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour. This is about noon and about three. And did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. 
and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the first, or the last unto the first. And when they came, they were hired about the eleventh hour. They received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they had or should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is. Go thy way, I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So, the last shall be first, and the first last. For many called, few chosen. So the story is told over the course of time. In this case, it's told over the course of of a day from early in the morning to late in the evening with intervening series of hours given for the workers. Secondly, it is told only about willing workers. Nobody is conscripted. All are looking for employment. And thirdly, the text is very clear that every man is aware of the wages he will be paid. This is a work illustration. Every man is aware of the wages he will be paid. So nobody works blindly. Everybody knows what they will be paid. But when payday comes, verses 8 through 12, every man gets the same wage, even though not every man has worked the same amount of time. And I think, folks, that we would know enough about human nature that none of us would think that that is fair. None of us would think that that was fair. If a guy hired you to dig a hole in his backyard and you started digging the hole at 6 o'clock in the morning and he agreed to pay you $100 for the day and at 5 o'clock at night a guy showed up and, and grabbed a shovel and started digging in the hole that you were digging and when the day came to an end, you got 100 and he got 100, you would not be happy. I would not be happy. I would argue that there is something fundamentally unfair about that system. I don't know. I might even throw some rocks through some windows or maybe burn down somebody else's house to make a point. That was sarcasm if you didn't catch it. What does the master say? In other words, what is the divine perspective on this scenario? The divine perspective is, verse number 13, everybody got what you were promised. Everybody got what you were promised. Whatever is right, you'll get. Whatever is yours, you will get. In other words, folks, if we could read it back into this, okay? If I could read it back into, into Mark's gospel or, or into, into Luke's go- or Matthew's gospel, Matthew 20, verse 19, 29. The promise of a hundredfold is not being undone here. Jesus is not going back on his word. Everybody got what they were promised. You knew what the wage would be. You agreed to it. Six o'clock in the morning, you want to go to work? Yes, I want to go to work. I will pay you a penny. Okay, I will work for a penny for the day. I hate, Jesus hasn't gone back on that. Hasn't taken back his word. Hasn't reneged. Verses 14 and 15, Jesus adds the divine dimension to that. Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? There comes the rub, isn't it, folks? I mean, isn't that really the rub with us a lot of times? Is it... We just don't like the way God has done it. 
And God's answer is always going to be the same. But I'm God, it's mine. I can do with it what I will. I can do with you what I will. I can do with my stuff what I will. It's mine. It all belongs to me. And then Jesus asks the question that we need to be asked periodically. Does God's generosity to others offend us? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Does my generosity to another frustrate you? Because God is, folks, in verses 13, 14, and 15, generous. But his generosity is governed by his sovereignty. That is how he sees things. All right, so let me just, let me just make a, a few applications to that in conclusion. And, and one, I do not want to be unmindful of the immediate issue that is going on here in this passage in verse number 20. This has, we expect, reference to the far larger Jewish Gentile dimension of belief. In other words, you could think of it like this, right? God promised to the Jews a kingdom, and the Jews have borne the heat and the labor of the day. They have been beat up by the Philistines. They have been beat up by the Assyrians. They have been beaten up by the Babylonians. They have been in captivity uh, to the Babylonians and then ultimately to the Persians. Now they're under the Roman oppression, and the Gentiles are going to come along at the end of the day, and they're going to get the kingdom too. And to that the Lord would say, Is your eye evil because I am good? Does my generosity to the Gentiles offend you? And to them he would pose the same question. Or is it not mine to do with what I please? And the reality, folks, is that salvation isn't some kind of economic zero-sum game where if you get saved, right? If, if, if somebody gets saved, right? All the rest of us just lose a little tiny fraction of our blessing. Right? There's, there's this many blessings. There's a, a thousand blessings. And if a thousand people get saved, we're going to divide the blessings by a thousand and everybody gets one. But if two thousand people get saved, now there's only, we only get a half a blessing. Salvation is not a zero-sum game. God is not like that. There's enough for everybody to be blessed fully and completely. God is generous. But I would propose to you folks that furthermore, there are individual applications to this. There, there is a way of thinking about this. And right, what would we say? Right here we are, a church, a local church. Some of you, many of you, are just died in the wolf faithful people. Sunday morning, Sunday night, like the ticking of the clock. Time to take the offering, you're there. Time to do work, you're there. Time to participate, you're there. Time for something to be done, you're there. Not everybody's like that, are they? Not everybody's like that. Is God unjust to bless those people? Does he have the right to to be generous with them? What about the people who never are put in the position that Jesus talks about here? What if the Lord is generous with my children? <clears throat> what if the Lord chooses to be generous with my children? I can read through this and I can, I can ask myself, have my children had to forsake houses? or brethren or sisters, or my, are my son and my daughters alienated from each other over the cause of Jesus Christ? Is there that kind of division? Has one of them paid that price, standing up for Christ and being rejected by their family members? That never happened to my children. Have they had to leave their father or their mother for the cause of Christ? Has 
mom and I's lifestyle been such that they want to be faithful to the Lord and have to separate themselves from me? Have they ever been in that position? No, not, not to my knowledge. Well, what if the Lord wants to be generous to them? Is my eye going to be evil because God is good? Some of you, many of you, <clears throat> you manage businesses, you run households, you own homes, you own property. You fend for yourselves. Not everybody's like that. <clears throat> Not everybody can do that. The Bible talks about people that can't be like that. They are not biblically to be the objects of ridicule, but of compassion. What if God wants to be generous to them? What if we, what if we, what if we get to the very end of this thing and the Lord is dispensing the judgments and we discover that a guy that we never thought much of is more lavishly rewarded than we are? Is our eye going to be evil because God is good? What about the very thief on the cross, folks? What about, what about the guy who gets saved in his dying breath? Should we make him live in the inner city of heaven? Not that heaven would have a ghetto, but maybe the less desirable neighborhood because he never did much for the Lord. And I'm just fabricating questions and examples folks, to, to illustrate the point that, that God is generous and he has promised generosity to all of his people over and above the fact that they are not burning eternally in hell. But that is, that is governed by his sense of justice, not ours. That is governed by his generous nature, not the nature of a mere human being. And so, the last will be first. First will be last. No injustice will be done. <clears throat> I don't think Paul is really trying to contradict that when he reminds us that we will reap what we sow. When he says in 1 Corinthians 3, if any man work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. God is generous. So folks, if you are a willing, faithful, obedient worker, you are not going to lose in the service of the Lord even if, and I hope that this would never be true of any of us, even if we think that somebody less deserving has apparently got more, somebody we can't quite figure out is apparently doing better at this than we are. The Lord is generous to all of his people. That is the promise and never unjust. All right, let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that... <clears throat> you would help us to think about these matters as you do, and I pray that we would desire above all things to be faithful. That if we have figuratively, so to speak, been brought into the workforce early, if we have the ability to do much and long labor, if you have gifted us mentally and physically with those abilities to not begrudge your kindness to anybody else, but to rejoice and celebrate always in your goodness. Above all things, Father, may we appreciate the fact that you have saved us and delivered us from eternal punishment. Pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you if you would to stand, please. <clears throat>